Our next speaker is Diane Chan from the Peak Hour Institute at MIT talking about very interesting neurostimulation in Alzheimer's disease. Thank you, Lisa, for the opportunity to talk about our research efforts at MIT. Uh, today, I want to tell you a little bit about um, how we're trying to leverage brain rhythms to try and treat dementia in Alzheimer's disease. As we all know, Alzheimer's disease is a worldwide problem. Over 46 million people in the world suffer from Alzheimer's disease. Um, and in America, there's over 6 million uh, patients. And so we have been working hard in Li Wei Tsai's lab at MIT to really uh, find out what causes this disease, but also um, to see if we can use some of this knowledge to uh, combat uh, dementia. Developing a therapeutic for Alzheimer's disease has been uh, historically very difficult. Um, it's a multifactorial disease. Uh, as you can see on this slide, there's a lot of pathology that we do know about Alzheimer's, um, but there's still a lot that we don't know. We do see that there are amyloid deposits uh, over 20 years before someone might present to my clinic uh, with memory problems. And um, there's uh, neurofibrillary tangles uh, composed of tau uh, in the brain cells. And eventually there is uh, volume loss in the brain as the brain cells start to die. Um, as, as you know, cognitive impairment in Alzheimer's disease obviously results in a lot of functional deficits in patients and uh, it's really quite heartbreaking. In the SciLab, uh, we are very excited to uh, study more about how cognitive rhythms uh, contribute to, to Alzheimer's. Um, this was based on some studies that were done a very long time ago on Alzheimer's disease patients using magnetoencephalograms to look at um, synchronization of cognitive rhythms in um, Alzheimer's. And so uh, on the top panel there, you can see that using human uh, magnetoencephalogram, uh, patients with Alzheimer's disease in the black dots um, have a decreased synchronization uh, in the gamma band. And the gamma band or the gamma rhythms are uh, frequencies between 30 and 80 hertz. And the control subjects are in the white line. You could definitely tell in multiple regions of the brain there's just decreased um, synchronization. In mouse models of Alzheimer's disease, uh, which is the tools that we use all the time to study Alzheimer's and other neurodegenerative diseases, um, similarly, there is an alteration in the gamma band. Um, in particular, uh, you can see here um, there is decreases uh, in 40 hertz, uh, so there's a decrease in the 40 hertz power as well as stability um, throughout the network. And of course, um, these mouse models of Alzheimer's disease perform less well on uh, cognitive and behavioral testing. What I would like to present to you today is that in the Sci Lab, in collaboration with Ed Boyden's lab and Emory Brown's lab, uh, we're very excited to see if we can um, uh, break down uh, how we can use uh, these neural network activities to um, treat Alzheimer's disease. I think, f I'm not sure if this sounds going to work, but um, uh, I wanted to explain what brain rhythms really are. And I'm sure after all these fantastic talks um, that you, uh, you probably have a good idea. But um, the way the brain works is uh, different parts of the brain really communicates uh, by using brain rhythms. And uh, in a, in a well-functioning brain, uh, as you know, uh, different parts can communicate and synchronize easily. It's sort of like an orchestra uh, with a conductor uh, leading the band uh, playing a beautiful piece of music. But in uh, Alzheimer's disease, we now know that uh, different parts of the brain have difficulty communicating, and it sounds very um, uncoordinated. And so this is just a little cartoon to show you that um, complex networks really uh, come together in circuits so that we can perform all the functions of daily life. 
and um, the activity of many brain cells connected together creates these brain rhythms. Uh, and just to nail home the point here, we're trying to see if we can actually augment the gamma rhythms using different technologies uh, to um, reorganize the system, increase synchronization throughout the brain, and uh, treat dementia. Initially, these studies were done using um, optogenetics. This was a paper published in 2009 from, uh, in a collaboration for, with our lab uh, where we used optogenetics to stimulate the hippocampus of uh, a familial Alzheimer's disease mouse model um, at 40 hertz. And uh, we were surprised to find that with this stimulation, electrical stimulation, uh, there was a decrease in amyloid in the hippocampus itself. And so, um, after some consideration, we found some studies that were done in the early 90s where uh, using light, we can see that uh, you can entrain the brain of cats to, uh, to go at specific frequencies. And so using that knowledge, uh, we have developed different ways to stimulate the brain using uh, sensory stimuli, including light and sound. The initial concept was uh, created by someone sitting in the audience right now, Dr. Sook, but also in collaboration with other labs. Uh, we used LED lights to stimulate um, the mouse brain uh, at 40 hertz. And using uh, EFA's recordings, uh, you can see that there is a uh, increase in, in the 40 hertz uh, power spectra uh, when, you use, when you flicker the lights. And so we know, using this system, that when you use uh, light stimulation at 40 hertz, you can activate neurons in the visual cortex. And of course, we know that uh, the important part of the brain that's involved in, in Alzheimer's is the hippocampus, but this was a proof of concept. Uh, in these mouse models of Alzheimer's disease, using just this light flickering at 40 hertz, uh, we can see that there's a decrease in the amyloid deposits, which is shown in green here. So in the top row, you can see um, the amyloid is stained in green with no stimulation. This is the size of the plaques. And then with the gamma stimulation, with the, just the light flickering at 40 hertz, there is a decrease uh, there. And this is just a quantification. So you can see um, there is a decrease in amyloid levels when you use uh, the 40 hertz light flicker for an hour. And then uh, we measured these amyloid levels. Um, and then uh, you can see there's a more than 50% decrease. And this was done in the visual cortex. And so what we really wanted to do was to affect the amyloid levels, at least, um, in, in the hippocampus. And in combining different sensory modalities, we found that actually using two <laughs> sensory modalities, visual and auditory, we were able to affect a larger change with greater cortical engagement. Using uh, light and sound together now at 40 hertz, uh, we stimulated this uh, uh, 5x FAD mouse model uh, and uh, using clarity, so you could look at the whole brain, these white dots uh, are the amyloid uh, deposits. And in the uh, stimulated brain, there is a significant decrease of amyloid throughout the brain. This is after uh, one hour stimulation every day for seven days. And so what we really wanted to know now was uh, what's going on. <laughs> Uh, how is it that we can stimulate the brain using light at 40 hertz um, to remove amyloid? And one, question, one answer that we found was that actually the neurons were stimulated by this light, of course, and then they decreased their secretion of amyloid. But in addition, uh, the microglia in the brain was actually also activated by this light, and they went around and got, uh, actually was able to phagocytose uh, amyloid. And this is just a picture of microglia. Now the green is actually staining microglia. And in uh, the stimulated, uh, the non-stimulated brain, you can see that the microglia in the Alzheimer's mouse model is uh, uh, diseased, uh, they don't look completely healthy, but in the uh, mouse with the gamma stimulation using uh, light, um, 
at 40 hertz, there is an obvious change in the morphology of these cells. You can also see with the light stimulation at 40 hertz that there are microglia, more microglia around that have these uh, amyloid deposits in their bellies. And that is highlighted in the orange here. We're also interested to see what happens to tau pathology. Um, and we found that actually uh, using our, our light at 40 hertz, there is a decrease uh, not only in the amyloid, but also in the tau deposits in the brain. The other thing, things that we see is that with the light uh, stimulation at 40 hertz, there is uh, vasodilation in the capillaries. And in a very severe model of Alzheimer's disease, uh, we found that um, using uh, the light stimulation at 40 hertz, uh, there is a decrease in uh, neurodegeneration. And you can see that here, uh, there's a marked change. Uh, so uh, this is the control mouse, this is the CKP25 uh, mouse model, and there's obviously uh, a decrease in size of the brain because there's neuronal cell loss. And in the mouse that is treated with the 40 hertz light, for an hour a day for three weeks, um, you can see that there is a uh, preservation of these uh, neurons and less neuronal cell death. We also know now that um, if you use the light and light and sound for a longer periods of time, uh, there is increased, oops, increased synchronization and uh, more cortical engagement. So there's more parts of the brain that are affected. Using uh, behavioral testing, we also found that these mice did a lot better on their memory testing, um, as you can imagine. Um, and so what we really wanted to do now was to see if we could translate this technology to be used in people. In the Alzheimer's disease brain, there is significant uh, neurodegeneration. You can see uh, using our light flicker, at light and sound now, uh, we were hoping to see if we can um, boost gamma activity and thereby uh, reducing neurodegeneration and changing the course of Alzheimer's disease. Um, so doc, uh, thank you, Dr. Penna. Uh, we definitely talked to the FDA before we started doing this. And so uh, I'm glad that uh, we got advice from you. Well, not you directly, <laughs> but your team. And so uh, we developed several prototypes to deliver this light and sound uh, to be used in people. And we started off with healthy, young, very smart MIT students who volunteered uh, to come in for uh, safety evaluations. Um, and so what we did was uh, they came in, we did a little bit of a kind of assessment, and then uh, they used our light and sound uh, device in, in front um, while getting EEG recordings. Uh, and this was done really for a lot of safety reasons, but also for tolerability of uh, light levels and sound uh, volumes. And this is just some of the data that we have from our healthy uh, subjects. Uh, and so using light alone, you can see um, the purple line represents uh, the 40 hertz stim, and then the gray line is the baseline recording. The baseline recording was done uh, by obscuring the light and then uh, having while it's still on, uh, and then um, the subject is getting an EEG rec recorded. Uh, and you can see that the uh, 40 hertz light alone uh, really gives you a nice peak at 40 hertz, and so it's doing exactly what we wanted to to do. Uh, and then on the topographic map here, you can see that the uh, occipital area really lends most of the 40 hertz activity, which is expected because that's where the visual cortex is. Um, and then uh, using sound alone, there is also a peak here um, at 40 hertz um, over baseline, and uh, there's an excellent um, cortical engagement uh, in the CZ area. And then combined stimulation really gives you um, the most power in terms of uh, increasing 40 hertz stim. And we moved on to uh, recruit healthy, cognitively normal uh, 
subjects who are over the age of 55, um, so that we have two groups of patients who are healthy. Um, but uh, the young group here is, this is um, group data, showing that um, the combined stimulation really gives you the highest uh, entrainment at 40 hertz, and uh, followed by the visual and the um, auditory stim. Uh, but in the uh, more mature group, <laughs> you can see that there is uh, also the combined stimulation uh, gives you the best uh, entrainment. And so um, using topographic maps now, you can see that uh, where the signal is actually coming from uh, compared to baseline. The visual uh, stimulation again uh, uh, stimulates the 40 hertz uh, mostly in the occipital areas. Uh, and then the auditory stim um, highlights um, the uh, cortical um, areas here. And then the combined stimulation obviously gives you um, the, the most, uh, the strongest entrainment. We also used EEG to um, look at synchronization between different parts of the brain. And we found that using um, the light and sound alone, uh, you can uh, increase um, synchronization significantly uh, across multiple areas of the brain. And this was done using phase lock index. And so we have been recruiting um, patients now with mild Alzheimer's disease to come to MIT and help us with our study. Um, we, uh, the study was designed to see if we can uh, measure entrainment in patients in Alzheimer's to see if their entrainment is any different from our um, cognitively normal cohort, uh, but also so that we can uh, follow them over time and measure uh, many biomarkers of Alzheimer's disease to see if we could change the course of um, dementia there. We're also excited to um, see if uh, gamma entrainment can actually help uh, the cognitive abilities of those uh, with healthy aging. And so um, we're also looking for uh, people who would volunteer their brains to help us. And so this is the human uh, genus team. Uh, a lot of them are here today, so if you want to say hello. Um, but it's comprised of um, engineers and other uh, doctors besides myself, uh, and also an excellent clinical coordinator who has uh, wrangled a lot of people to come and help us. And this is work done uh, by a group of very uh, smart people at MIT, including uh, Dr. Li Wei Sai, who is my boss, uh, Emery Brown, Ed Boyden, and all these people have contributed uh, to all the mouse models and uh, the work done there. So thank you. couple of questions. So when you showed the mouse model and the healthy, ah, oh, yeah, the healthy controls one. So did, how long the stimulation lasts, the brain stimulation? So this is a snapshot, right? Yes, it is. And then you have the, the, like the light stimulation, and then mm -hmm. we can see the, the brain stimulation. So yes. how long the effect lasts? So that's my first question. The second one is, um, Looking at the population, and I'm not an ophthalmologist, <laughs> and considering that this population will have comorbidities that can also have like eye kind of like implications, mm -hmm. how much in your inclusion exclusion criteria you have, you know, like comorbidities related to eye vision um, out of the study? But I don't know if it will play a role or not in the, vis in the um, light simulation. And, um, yeah, and then do you have any neuropsych assessments? You, you, you mentioned memory games in yes. the protocol, <laughs> but not neuropsych, standard neuropsych mm -hmm. assessments. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so for the first question, um, the data that I showed you today is based on a very, uh, it's a one day visit at MIT. And uh, that data was from acute exposure to the stimulation, either visual uh, alone or auditory alone or combined. Um, and uh, what we found that was the brain reacts almost immediately within milliseconds of exposure to the stimuli. Um, 
However, because this is an acute visit, we also recorded their activity over the course of an hour, and you know the gamma power remained high throughout that time. Right after turning off the device, the activity again, uh, you know, declines almost immediately as well. And what we know, this is why this uh, lab is fantastic. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we're able to really work with the preclinical side to see, um, to answer some of these questions. And so we know that with the mouse models, if we expose um, the Alzheimer's mouse to the stimuli for um, multiple days or multiple weeks in a row, uh, there are more permanent changes um, to um, our, the electrical activity. And so now we've had patients with Alzheimer's using our device for nearly six months, and uh, we're still uh, we're we're still gathering all that data now. But uh, I'm hoping to see um, different changes and more permanent changes um, to the electrical activity recorded by EEG. And so for the second question, in terms of inclusion and exclusion criteria, uh, we do a baseline visual and uh, hearing test. And so uh, we, um, we exclude people who have significant visual um, problems as well as hearing trouble. But really, people can wear their hearing aids while using our device, and that's been fine. People with cataracts, for example, um, that makes it more difficult for them uh, for their visual entrainment. But with the combined entrainment, uh, combined uh, stimuli, they 100% of um, the people who've come through have uh, entrained well still. Um, and then I forgot your third question. I oh, right. I wrote memory games up there because uh, when I show this to patients with Alzheimer's, they get very um, anxious about neuropsych testing. But in truth, it is neuropsych testing. <laughs> and it's a long battery that lasts about three to four hours. Yes. And so we uh, have a very uh, comprehensive battery. Oh, hi. hi uh Beautiful work. Uh, it was really interesting. But uh, so I have actually a whole slew of questions, but I'm not going to go through all of them. But <laughs> just a couple ones. Um, one is is um, where the amyloid was removed. Um, I mean, did you see it globally in the brain? Um, which you know, since it's a kind of visual, visual and auditory stimulus, yes. you know, why, why would it be happening globally? And I, it, it kind of relate to my other question, which is, what's so magic about 40 hertz that seems to yeah. be conserved across mammals? It's like the cleanup signal, like you know, yeah. time, time, time to, to do housekeeping. Or I just curious to hear your thoughts on that. There is a a lot of questions surrounding why 40 hertz works well, um, but that's the magic of using mouse models. We were able to use many different frequencies uh, over periods, long periods of time, to see if other frequencies worked as well. And uh, I would be lying if they didn't work, but um, uh, 35, for example, worked less well, 45 worked less well, and so 40s in the mouse was the best. However, in the human, we're different, and that's why we had to engineer a whole different light and sound to be used for people. Uh, we still don't know if 40 hertz is the best uh, frequency to be used um, for this purpose. Um, and then in terms of removal of amyloid, that pathology and that mechanism is still yet to be clarified. But um, what we think, just for now, <laughs> at this time point, is that um, causing this entrainment for just an hour a day somehow triggers a cascade of um, activities um, that help with the cleanup of amyloid, and one of which I showed you was um, activation of microglia. Uh, that continues and persists even after the light is off. Um, and then the vasodilation, I think all these, um, all these processes actually work together to uh, continually remove the amyloid and the tau um, in a way that we yet, we're yet to fully understand. And that's what we really want to focus on at MIT, is to figure out um, the mechanisms uh, by which this works. Did you, did you standardize, in a way, sleep pattern or me measure it as a co-founding factor? Because as you, uh, sleep has also an amyloid cleaning effect. 
Yes, we are very excited about sleep, uh, and that is one of the measures that may or may not have had that up there on the screen. But we uh, are using actigraphy to um, longitudinally uh, measure sleep patterns in our population. And uh, we have a very excited undergrad here, uh, Noah, who, <laughs> who really um, wants to study whether um, improving sleep in improves glymph glymphatic flow and thereby removes amyloid in that way. There's been a lot of new studies also published uh, most recently that show that um, improving sleep can prevent progression to Alzheimer's. And I wonder if somehow we, we are improving people's sleep and thereby also removing amyloid. We do, say, we do see on our daily questionnaires and also from our, our measures of sleep that people do sleep better after um, using our 40 hertz versus control. Hi, thank you so much, really great talk. Um, just two questions, one practical and maybe one mechanistic. Um, from a practical perspective, I think you hinted at the intensity level of this, and I'm curious to know sort of at what point is it sort of a linear relationship between, if you guys have looked at it, in terms of intensity of visual and auditory stimuli yes. and the efficacy. And second, you know, more from a mechanistic perspective and following on the earlier question, you know, we tend to think about things like Alzheimer's as an inflammatory disorder, at least mm -hmm. until now. Um, and so in many ways, it's interesting to this theory that you are sort of recruiting microglia because in many ways, I've at least read theories about how the propagation of these plaques is in many, is a sort of frustrated phagocytosis type of uh, mechanism. So how do you tie those two together? Um, so in terms of light and sound levels, um, we have done a titration to look at the best amount, amount of lux that uh, we need to cause uh, entrainment and also how many decibels of sound. Um, and so that all has been uh, done and actually kind of surprisingly, um, it's not necessarily the brightest light or the loudest sound actually. And so, uh, you know, people are people, and we'll see uh, as we have more people recruited whether, um, whether we can get a better uh, dose response in that way. Um, but in terms of activation of the microglia, uh, that is something we still yet, uh, we're still examining. Um, there's at least several kinds of different microglia, and um, one kind responds and increases inflammation in the brain, but there's other kinds that are um, more of a senescent or uh, kind of cleanup <laughs> type microglia. And using our mouse models again, we're able to look at um, the the genetic profiles uh, of the cells that are activated by our light and sound. And maybe we'll uh, show you in a publication soon <laughs> about uh, which uh, populations are being helpful in this case. Thank you. Very much. Yes, thank you.